All right, good evening, everyone. Good evening. I have a microphone, or I could use my, when I used to teach ninth grade English voice. Can you say we're going to do one act, the first act, Romeo and Juliet. Oh, no. A different time. Uh, uh, listen, I, I want to be very brief. I want to uh, welcome you all to our magnificent college here. I want to I wanna recognize uh, one of my many bosses and my department chair and my dean. It seems like I work for all of you, and I'm happy to do it. Uh, what a wonderful uh, turnout for the Vital Voices series. And we have some magnificent speakers, state elected uh, representatives that are, that are leaders in, in, in education and finance and higher ed, as well as representatives from the TEA, as well as the Mayor's Liaison for Educational Initiatives. And uh, so you have some of the most uh, important vital voices for public education locally and at the state here to talk to you at UH Downtown, where we believe that the D stands for difference. Yes? I'm working on it. <laughs> where we, where we, where, where at downtown, the second largest university in the, in the, in the largest city in the state, and, but nothing is more important than you all being here today and giving us an opportunity to help inform you to be critical agents of education policy and more importantly, thoughtful and engaged citizens. <laughs> this is what we hope to do at the University of Houston downtown and I want to I want to congratulate Steve and, the, and, and and the Dean and the college for putting together this magnificent series okay where we help to bring vital voices to your attention so with that I'll turn it back over to Dr. Villano thank you all for being here are you gonna heckle no, no, no. <laughs> I wouldn't stand a chance if you did <laughs> Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Dr. Munoz. Um, we are thrilled to be able to have this panel with us, and we are even more thrilled that you guys are able to come and join us for tonight. I, I don't like doing uh, prepared remarks, but their accomplishments and their, their bios are just too, too much to, for me to be able to read it off the top of my head. Each person on this panel has done wonderful things, both individually and for the public good. And so I don't want to mess anything up, so for, uh, excuse me, but I'm going to read from my prepared remarks. Okay, um, to my right here is A.J. Crabill. Uh, Mr. Crabill is the Deputy TA Commissioner for Governance, Governance, and he was raised in and out of foster care from birth until high school. AJ bounced around enough to have attended 11 schools prior to graduation. He attended urban, suburban, rural, private, public, and parochial schools, lived with white families, families of color, lived in racist communities, and inclusive communities, experienced loving homes and homelessness. Guided by the idea that student outcomes don't change until adult behaviors change, and drawing on his intimate familiarity with the triumphs and terrors of America's safety nets for children, he has devoted much of his adult life to advocating for the well-being of our nation's most vulnerable youth. AJ currently serves as the Texas Education Agency's Deputy Commissioner for Governance, in this position, some of Mr. Crable's responsibilities include focusing on school improvement, providing governance to administration, supporting and innovating school systems, and school day safety and discipline. In terms of governance, Mr. De Mr. Crable develops and facilitates leadership training sessions to educate current and potential school administrators and school board members on how to better execute the responsibility their positions entail. Also, if a district is underperforming, Mr. Crable will often require administrators and board members to undergo training to adjust their plans to improve their respective districts. And, believe it or not, this, oh, I can't even lift it, this is how Mr. Crable arrived here today, okay? So, um, we'll have to do a he'll have to do a demonstration, yes. <laughs> so I, I, I was freaking out, like, well, where is he? Where is he? And then, I, and, and then there he rolled in, uh, as it was. So. <laughs> so, so there you go. So please give a round, uh, a hearty welcome to uh, Deputy Commissioner Crable. Now to my left is Juliet Stepech. 
Miss DePetch was born and raised in Houston, Texas. Miss DePetch, yeah, let's get a round of applause there. Miss DePetch grew up in the east end of Houston, the daughter of immigrant parents from Argentina and Mexico. She graduated valedictorian of the High School for Law Enforcement and Criminal Justice and earned an academic scholarship to Rice University, where she graduated in 1996 with a Bachelor of Arts magna cum laude in political science, policy studies, and religious studies. She was awarded the Joseph Cooper Prize as the most outstanding policy student in her graduating class. After graduating, she spent the summer as an adult advisor for the YMCA's International Exchange Program to Kyoto, Japan, and participated in the Hiroshima Peace Conference. Juliet received her law degree from the University of Texas School of Law and is very proud to be the first attorney in her family. She is a civil litigator and certified medi med mediator, blah, certified mediator, and has courtroom, trial, and appellate experience in numerous counties throughout the state of Texas. She was admitted to the Texas State Bar in November of 99. Prior to her work with the mayor as the director of education, Juliet was elected to the Houston Independent School District's Board of Education as a trustee of District 8 in a special election. Later in 2010, later in 2011, Juliet was re-elected to serve a full four-year term. She served as chairperson of HISD's audit committee for three years and pushed for administrative and educational reform and was elected by her peers to serve as the Board of Education's president in 2014. On February 1st, 2016, Mayor Sylvester Turner selected Juliet to serve as the Director of Education, a new position with the mayor's administration. Juliet passionately believes, and if anyone talks to her for five seconds, you know that everything Juliet does is with passion. She passionately <laughs> believes, where's my line here? Okay, that public education is a human right, is the great social equalizer, and is the foundation for a prosperous community. She's excited to collaborate with educational institutions across the city and community partners to build relationships that are lasting and promote educational opportunity and excellence in our great city of Houston. Juliet is currently involved in the Community Conversations listening tour that, mental, that the Mental Health of America is hosting in conjunction with UNICEF and the City Council. Community Conversations is an 11-week event where city district residents and city council members open a dialogue about post-Harvey trauma, how trauma has affected their children and their community, and what steps we can begin to take to move forward into long-term recovery for each community. So please join me in giving a, a huge round of applause for Juliette Stepetch. So now to my left here is um, our great state senator, Kel Seliger. And Mr. Seliger, is, was first elected to the Texas Senate in 2004. Senate District 31, which he represents, spans 37 counties, from the Panhandle to the Permian Basin, and includes Amarillo, Midland, Odessa, and Big Spring. Mr. Kelliger was, uh, Seliger was born in Amarillo and raised in Borger. <laughs> Senator Seliger is a graduate of Borger Public Schools and Dartmouth College. He spent 35 years in the steel industry. Senator Seliger currently serves as chairman of the Senate Higher Education Committee and is a member of the Senate Education Committee, Select Finance Committee, and Select, Sen and Select Committee on Natural Resources and Economic Development. The senator has been recognized by many groups for his principles, as well as his dedication to small government and local control. Seliger is privileged to be the recipient of the Texas Municipal League Legislator of the Year Award, Texas Conservative Coalition's Conservative Champion Award, Texas Wildlife Association's Conser Conservation Hero Award, and the Texas Parent Teacher Association's Legislative Honor Roll. Most recently, he was awarded the Humanities Texas Leader in Education Award and named Senate Legislator of the Year by the Texas Nurse Practitioners. During the recent 85th legislative session 
As chairman of the Senate Higher Education Committee, Senator Seliger secured an additional $1.7 million in funding for the University of Texas of the Permian Basin College of Engineering, which will be used to expand the chemical and electrical engineering programs. Additionally, $4.2 million is provided to UTPB as a hold harmless to ensure the school does not lose more than 10% of its state funding. Senator Seliger also succeeded in securing $4.17 million for Texas Tech University's future med veterinary medical school. As part of his continued service on the education community, the senator authored Senate Bill 463, a bill that extends the option of individual graduation committees for students who passed all of their courses but failed to pass up to two state-mandated tests. Chairman Seliger and Representative John Smithy passed Senate Bill 654, which will help improve access to health care in rural and medically underserved parts of Texas. Prior to his election to the Senate, Senator Selger served four terms as mayor of Amarillo and as a member of the Amarillo City Commission and the Amarillo Civil Service Commission. He and his wife Nancy reside in Amarillo and have two sons, Jonathan and Matthew. Please welcome Senator Kel Seliger. And last, but by no, in no question about it, certainly not least. Don't, don't put my class rank in there. Uh, <laughs> uh, Unless we've already yeah, we can't all be valedictorians. Uh, 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 okay. I didn't know they were keeping track. Well, okay. I won't, I won't say where your position I was. I to do that. Redact the GPAs. Well, you know. Uh, uh, okay, well, I won't do that. Uh, Senator Taylor, Larry Taylor, is a lifelong Texan and Baylor University graduate, raised in Friendswood. He and his wife Carrie have three adult children and two grandchildren. Senator Taylor owns Truman Taylor Insurance in Friendswood, an independent agency started by his father more than 50 years ago. The agency recently merged with the Galveston Insurance Agency. Before his election to the Senate in 2012, Senator Taylor served five terms in the House of Representatives Currently, Senator Taylor serves as the chairman of the Senate Committee on Education and as a member of the Senate Finance, Business, Commerce, and Higher Education Committees. In 2017, Senator Taylor was appointed to the Texas Commission on Public School Finance, which will explore ways to update and improve how Texas funds its schools. He also co-chairs the Joint Interim Committee to Study a Coastal Barrier System, which aims to identify methods of storm protection along the Texas Gulf Coast, and is a member of the Legislative Budget Board, a permanent joint commission responsible for developing budget and policy recommendations for legislative appropriations. Senator Taylor was also named chair of a Senate Select Committee to Study School Violence in June following the tragedy at Santa Fe High School. Senator Taylor is the recipient of the Bay Area Houston Economic Partnership's 2017 Quasar Award, which recognizes an outstanding leader who demonstrates a strong and continual effort to support the business foundations of the greater Bay Area Houston communities. He serves on the board of Hope Village, a residential and day program for people with developmental and disabilities and as the director and chairman of the board for the Houston-based Texas Texan Bank. He is also president of the Texas Conservative, Conservative Research Institute. Senator Taylor represents Senate District 11, comprised of portions of Brazoria, Galveston, and Harris counties. Please welcome Senator Larry Taylor. Okay, so enough with the script. So, so this is what I'd like to do. I would like to have each of the pe people on our panel to tell you, spend about 10 minutes to tell you what they believe their top issues are that are facing Texas public education. After each person speaks, I'll open up the floor to some questions for that direct person. So you don't have to wait to the end if you have a question for an individual. 
So, and then I also, we have questions that were submitted to me about what some of your concerns are for the top issues in education. So I will read some of those questions. And if you, how many of you that are in this room submitted questions to the address on the email? One person, couple, two, three, four, five, six, okay. So we'll call, I'll call on you if you have. I have your comments in here, and I also have some late comments. So we'll call, try to get all questions answered. I want this to be as interactive as possible. So um, we will start. Let's start with Senator Taylor, if you want. OK. Hello, and good evening. Thank you for the invitation to be a part of this panel and for the opportunity to visit with you. Uh, we have folks working in social services, education, what all we've got here. We've got a number of different folks here. And uh, what we're doing in the state of Texas is trying to move our state forward. You know, we're behind in a lot of areas. Our population has changed dramatically, and education has to meet those challenges. One of the things I've been working on since I've been the chairman of the Education Committee, I, I was on it for one session in 2015 and became chairman in 17 and 19. And what we've been working on since that time I've been there, one is training up our workforce you know, we kind of had to switch gears. A lot of people thought everyone, we're training everyone to go to a four-year university. But that's not what everyone's going to do. And there's a lot of great careers that we need, but they require some kind of post-secondary, whether it's an a associate's degree or certification. So we, we've kind of made that switch to giving people options in school. Of course, a lot of these kids, if they were never going to a four-year university and they weren't interested in what we were doing, what we call them? we call them dropouts. Well, obviously, that's not good. So we try to make sure we, we have opportunities for all of our students. We're, we're kind of in that transition. We're well into it, uh, but particularly in this area, industry has joined in, community colleges have joined in, you're seeing it, and we have career tech uh, buildings being built by our public schools as well as our community colleges. So we're reaching that, but a lot of it, in the, in the bigger picture, is just moving education in the 21st century. You know, the idea of having kids sit in rows facing a teacher giving a lecture is kind of the way we used to do it a long time ago. And unfortunately, we're still doing that in a lot of cases. But that's not the way these kids are coming prepared or coming ready for school. Uh, and frankly, that's not the same skills we need for a 21st century workforce. And you know, if you look at what's around now, the industries that are out there today and what people are doing, some of these industries weren't around here 10 years ago. And frankly, the kids that you'll be working with and you and yourselves, we're going to have industries we've never even heard of. So we can't train people on a particular skill other than the skill of learning how to learn. Because what's going to happen from this point on is we're going to all have to continue to learn the new things. If we're going to keep up, we've got to have those skills. And we'll be able to work together in groups. That's what we hear a lot from the workforce. We're not creating assembly line workers anymore. That's, that's the, the past. So we've got to train people to think creatively, problem solving. You know, the last thing you need on assembly line is creativity, right? Talk about messing things up. So, but in this new 21st century, that's exactly what we need. And we need people coming up with innovative things and fixes and all that. So we're trying to transition from the old to the new. And a lot of that's how do we get our educational system to, to change. There's always inertia. People kind of resist change. But we're seeing a lot of things out there that are really working. So we're, we're promoting those things. We'll probably talk about some of that a little later. Blended learning, self-paced learning, uh, you know, those types of things. Using technology. I mean, frankly, the, to have an educational system today where you want people to recite facts and figures and years and all of a sudden, hey Siri, when did, I mean, so, so it's kind of like, I, I kind of related to when we had this whole question about whether or not to use calculators and math tests. Really? I mean, the calculators, that's what they're going to be using the rest of their life. I think you need to teach them where the questions are hard enough, even when they use a calculator, they got to understand what they're doing. Same thing to teach kids as if there is no internet, really. I don't think we're going back to not having an internet. So the test should be reflective of how do I look into it and get more nuanced into it and get deeper in the subject rather than just reciting facts because those are at your fingertips. I mean, Siri could probably give this speech for me if I asked her. Uh, <laughs> and that's where we're moving. Oh, she, look at that. Go ahead. I'm listening. <laughs> Siri, hush. Okay, I'm sorry. That's so true. She's trying to give my speech right now. Things coming up this session. I've been on Public School Finance Commission that started in January this year. Our school finance, much of it is 40, 30, 25 years old. Once again, what does the world look like today versus what it looked like 30 and 25, even 10 years ago? I know you are, Siri. You can hush. 
She's trying to interrupt now. Um, I won't say that anymore, S-I-R-I. -I. I won't say that. Uh, but the Public School Finance Commission, we've also got to bring our finance system into the 21st century. And we've had some great work. This is a very diverse commission from educators to superintendents to legislators to business people, uh, employers. We've just got a whole gamut of people on there. And we've come up with some very good consensus things out of that very diverse group of things we'll be working on this session to try to bring us into the 21st century. And frankly, our finance system needs to reflect the different demographics that we face in our state today. How many of you are aware that our largest demographic now in our school district, our students, is lower income, qualifying for free and reduced lunch? It's not just large, it's 60% of our student body. And it's also our fastest growing demographic. So you see the importance of educating those students. We can't afford to let those kids, well, they're just not going to do as well. They, they come from a low income back. That's not acceptable. And we have schools that are doing it. They're teaching those students. I'll give you a real quick example. I didn't start my time on my 10 minutes. Dallas ISD has an ACE program. Dallas ISD is very large, but they've had schools that have been failing for numerous years. Blanton Elementary is a perfect example. They were at a passing rate of about 50%. 50% of their students historically had passed tests. 50%. They came up with a program. They, they identified their best teachers they pay, and principals. They paid them more money, and they sent them to more challenging schools. Blanton Elementary in one year went from 50% passing to 80%. Wow. Within two years, they were passing Highland Park ISD. It was one of the highest wealth school districts in the state of Texas. That's a low-income area. They could do it. I believe that talent and abilities are spread evenly throughout eth every ethnic, every socioeconomic group. They're all out there. We just got to give them the opportunities and address the needs that they have. So we're working on those types of things. We'll be doing a lot of that. The School Finance Commission, very difficult. The reason our formulas are 40, 30, and 25 years old is because it's very, very difficult to pass. Everything we do with school finance, if you fix one thing, it messes up three other things. And guess who we hear from in the legislature? Not the people who benefited. They never come and say, wow, that was great. All we hear from is the people who said, hey, we lost money on this and this and this. So we're trying to come up with a fair system that we can all agree is a fair way to do it and try to transition to that new system that everybody understands and agrees is the best way to go. Right now we have districts paying consultants to tell them how much their money they're, they're going to get from the state. That's, that's unacceptable. It shouldn't be that complicated. They should be able to calculate that on, on their own. Um, I had one more thing. School safety, I'm sorry. Something came up, obviously, unexpectedly in my district, Santa Fe. And, you know, I always talk about education is the most important thing we, we do in the legislature just behind safety. Because if you're not safe, it doesn't matter about the rest of it. And particularly when you're talking about education, our students need to be safe. They need to feel safe or they're not going to be able to get that education that they need. That's a new thing that's kind of come up in recent years. You know, we've had schools focusing on it somewhat, but now that it's happened right here in Santa Fe, right behind Parkland, there's a lot of intense uh, things going on. That, and, and once again, we had another select committee on that that I was chairing, and we, we came up with, once again, a very diverse group, but we came up with some consensus items. The best thing you could do for school safety is prevent prevention. Once the shooting or whatever violence starts, there's nothing good that happens after that. So the best thing you do is prevention. And so we need more mental health intervention counselors in our campuses. If you can identify these students who are having troubles with, as they're first getting off the path, where things are starting, if you can get to them then, you can bring them back. But if they get too far down the road, then we see outbursts and outbreaks of violence like we've seen. So the best thing we do is intervention counselors. The second thing is, if we are going to have those types of it, we need to be prepared for them. And that's more school safety resource officers, whether it's a, a school district p police department, or they contract with a local law enforcement, or they have a marshal program in other parts of the state. We have to get people there responding very quickly. Uh, I've, we've been told during this commission process that on average in a school shooting, there's an average of eight to 10 murder attempts per minute. Let that sink in, eight to 10 per minute. So every minute, you're talking about eight to 10 lives. In Santa Fe, it was three minutes, and they had si uh, 10 killed and 16 wounded. So it's right there in that average of 8 to 10 per minute. So we have to have people there able to respond quickly uh, when we do have it. But the best thing is prevention. So we'll be working on school safety. And I'm probably well over my 10 minutes. I have a tendency to do that, and I apologize. But I have a passion for what we're doing in education. We have to do better. You know, the world is improving at this rate, and we're improving at this rate. And we can't afford to fall further behind. Uh, thank you.
Thank you, Senator. So one of the questions that was sent in to me was, how can we keep students safe without interfering with the learning process? Oh, I, I think you can do that. And part of it is having resource officers around that pe kids, students get familiar with, they know them. It's not like a, an oppressive uh, you know, presence that, that there are law enforcement around on campus. We, we've had, in some smaller towns, they're talking about putting like one of their substations on a campus, mm -hmm. just so there are police there interacting. And then you have the school resource officers. They're not necessarily street cops, because there's a different deal. If you're out working on the street, you have a little different demeanor, because of, you, you probably develop it, because some of the people you're dealing with, you're not typically dealing with the people that are doing the best, or you're seeing them at their worst time. But that's not what you want having interact with students necessary, but having people that are trained as school resource officers, having the counseling. And, and I'll just tell you this, you know, after 9-11, many of you are probably too young to remember what happened after 9-11, but our world changed. Our mindset changed. You know, before 9-11, if your plane got hijacked, which used to happen, everyone was trained just to stay in your seat, we'll go wherever the hijacker takes us, they'll finally get out and we'll move on. But after 9-11, nobody's sitting in their seat for anything. Somebody acts like they're threatening the plane, they get the tar beat out of them. That's a post-9-11 mindset. For our students and for our schools and our faculty, it's a different mindset. It's a different day. Now they're looking. And frankly, if students hear one other student say something, they're reporting it, and they need to. Uh, I was just talking to Texas City today. They've had like four arrests in the last week for kids making threats. No longer can you make these threats. They're not funny, ha-ha. People are taking it very seriously. So it's, so the idea is you fortify some of it. It doesn't look like a fort. It doesn't look like a prison. But you have some secure access. You're going to see a lot of technology. I was surprised how much technology is already in some of these schools that I was not aware of. You know, the cameras and those types of things, the different kind of tones and alarms, and they don't necessarily just have bells going off. Now they can actually come on and, and make announcements. They have code words that they say that teachers know. So there's a lot of things going on to make sure we make sure these kids are safe in our campuses. Uh, but a lot of us people having a different mindset. But I think the students will be fine. It's, it's a shock, and, and just, I think it's important that we still remember, because I hear a lot of kids saying they're afraid to go to school and they're afraid of this. This is still a very rare thing that happens. Well, I think we need to keep that in mind. We don't overreact, that we get paranoid. And I think it's important for students to understand that, because when, when you hear that, you need to encourage that that's not happening every day. In fact, it's almost NPR. Uh, did a study on that, and they were over-reporting the number of school shootings. I think they could verify like 12 over a period of time. There had been like several hundred reported. So we need to understand that it's a serious problem, but it's not as frequent as people have been kind of gotten that mindset. So I think reality is very important in that, too, to make sure our kids feel safe. Does anyone have a question for Senator Taylor? Yes, sir. Well, since we're, since we're taping this, I want to make sure that we get your comments. Well, I didn't know we were taping this. <laughs> Greetings. The next question is for Kel. <laughs> <laughs> Greetings. My name is Damon Barone, and I have a question about um, financing in the school um, school funding. Uh, currently, the district that I live in, 85% of their budget is allocated towards administrative staff, um, and it's a, a small population of administrative staff. They have um, directors of directors of directors, and they, in my opinion, abuse our tax money. So what is the... Um, what is the recourse that me as a taxpayer has to get the district aligned to put some of those fundings towards education? For example, we have six schools in improvement required, and they're all strategically, well, I say strategically, they're all obviously in one regional location of our district. So that bothers me a lot. So they like to say that we have a, a, a budget problem, but we have actually a spending problem. So how do we correct that? And that is a big part of the, the issue that we're having. Now, you're a part of an independent school district, right? ALEAF ISD, independent school district. So we give a lot of local control. So those spending decisions on administration, a lot of that is totally up to that district. So who has control over that? Anyone? Voters. The board. And how does a board member get on the board? An election. How many people vote in those elections? The percentage is very small. When you do vote, you're a very powerful voter. Everybody votes power as a voter. If you vote, you're voting for like 100 people. Or in a school board, you may be voting for 1,000 people. So you show great power when you show up and vote, knowing those issues. Second thing, we, from the state level, we want local control. 
until the point where they're not doing a good job. So we've done a couple things. One, we just came up with an A through F to help people better I have a better idea of what's going on in their local, either their campus or their district. So what's happened in some of these larger districts, they have a lot of campuses, and they keep their overall rating up, but there are certain campuses that have been failing for years. Houston ISD has some that have been failing for 10 years, a decade. So two things we've done. One, your whole district is now being held accountable for those poorly performing campuses. So we're, HISD, is here. they had like 14 before. We passed this law that you're, you're going to take over your whole district if you don't get it fixed. They're down to four. Uh, and Harvey give them another year to get that fixed and hope they'll get it done within this next year. But some of these have been on there for 10 years. Once again, public education career is 12 years. And you're going to schools that's been failing for 10 years. That's your whole public school career. You are sending off those kids to a very dismal future because they've not gotten the education that they deserve. Um, so we are trying to do that. The second thing, we've sped up the process of moving in on some of these campuses. So it used to be like seven, eight years. And there was a big debate, like, really? You want to defend letting a, a poor performing school keep going for seven, eight years? We sped up to like three years, and we actually have to kick in a plan. In the first year, the TEA has to approve that, and then they go into the second year, and it's still not working. We bring in board of managers, which is really local people, but they're professional people that have some you know, insights and those kind of things. So we've done what we can uh, along those lines, but let me just draw you real quick on A through F. I gotta say, because there's a lot of discussion about A through F, a lot of pushback. Here's the shocking thing. The old system we had, it was improvement required, which you referred to, and met standard. Do you know what improvement required was? It was the seventh percentile and below. That's who needed improvement. So if you were in the eighth percent, you met standard. Whose standard is that? When I tell you that we have such a 36% uh, of our students qualify based on SAT and ACT for college or ready for college, um, that's not a good standard. A through F, I think we all understand A through F, right? And here's the deal. If you're in the 8th percentile and you're getting the same rating as somebody in the 99th percentile, who knows the difference? If you're a parent of a child on that campus, you hear you met standard, you say, well, we're doing okay. But the story is an A through F, if you're a C, we know exactly what we need to do to get to a B. And you're, I'm already hearing these conversations. We came out of the ratings for districts, and they're already having those conversations. What do we need to do to get a B? Or if we're a B, what does it take to get an A? So they're already, that's, that's going to be a process of continuous improvement. Even if you got an A, you may have scored not as well in some other categories. You know exactly what you need to improve on. So the, the goal is to get everybody from A through F right now is a bell curve. Move them over to A's. And I'll tell you one thing real quick, because one thing we heard a lot, A through F is just going to measure zip codes. Students don't have a choice. I mean, schools don't have a choice who their students are. It's just who lives around there, right? What happened was, A through F, 15% of our high percentage, low income student population schools got an A. Got an A. So that shows you it can be done. So all these other schools going, well, you know, our kids are poor and they don't come from a good background. I don't want to hear any more excuses. A lot of that's lowered expectations, and it's time to improve our expectations for everybody and get them all up to speed. Thank you, Senator Taylor. I'm going to turn the microphone over to a protesting Juliet Stepech. And uh, Juliet, you can tell us, take about five to seven minutes to tell us about what you think, in your mind, from your perspective, are the top issues facing Texas public education, especially from the city of Houston, HISD standpoint. Is that because Larry took a bunch of yeah, that, exactly, yeah. Hey, so you're going to have two minutes. Hey, two minutes. You've got two minutes, yeah. <laughs> well, um, first of all, thank you very much for this opportunity. It's such a pleasure to be on this panel and to be able to spend some time with you. I am having a hard time sitting down because I can't see everyone in the audience, and I'm short in and of itself. Um, but first and foremost, it's like just starting in this journey in public education, um, looking at the opportunities that present, um, you know, there's such tremendous challenges, and yet this is also such a beacon of hope in terms of a cornerstone of our democracy, the entire ability to look at whether a city is going to be prosperous or not. One of the greatest indices to look at is the education level of a population. 
Houston is often touted and described as the most diverse city in the country. And I recently had an opportunity to meet with a Dr. Lindsay from NYU who said, Juliet, Houston is the second most prosperous city in the country. Now, I don't know who's number one. I don't know, maybe it's New York. I was really surprised by that statistic. The mo we are second most prosperous in the country. I was really surprised to hear that. But then we're 64th when it comes to income equality, right? So you oftentimes hear Mayor Sylvester Turner say, you know, I don't want to be a mayor of haves and have nots. And I remember when I was a school board member um, going and visiting the schools, there was a school named Fur High School in the East End, and the students made a beautiful video, and it was called The Other Side of Town. And they said, why is it that our side of town is lacking the resources that we see that are so ready available on the other side of town? Don't we deserve to have those same opportunities as well? And so, you know, I tell folks I started on the school board thinking that I was an informed, engaged Houstonian. I'm a native Houstonian. I've lived here my whole life. I've had the opportunity to serve as a mentor and a volunteer at local high schools. And then I serve on the school board, and I thought I was going to be able to help good schools become better, help children follow their passions and dreams. And my goodness, was I wearing rose-colored lenses. Well, first of all, how many people in here even know what a school board trustee does? All right, we only have a handful of people, a handful of people, right? And so very few people know what a school board trustee does. And very few people vote for the school board trustee. Or I should say this, very few people make an informed decision when they go to the bottom of the ballot and they vote for that school board member. And oftentimes they may look and they say, which name sounds nicest? <laughs> or who in the world you know, did my family member tell me to vote for, right? And so I, I remember when I first started running for the school board, they're like, well, Julia, do you know what a school board member does? No, I don't, right? And yet it's one of the most critical, valuable, quasi-governmental institutions that exists within the city of Houston. Yes, how many ISDs are in the city of Houston? That's a lot, I like that, very good general. That's good, you get a gold star. How many school districts are in the city of Houston's boundaries? 33. Oh my goodness, you get a gold star. Someone give her an extra piece of pizza. So <laughs> there are 17 independent school districts in the city of Houston. If you look at that, that's a pipeline of about 903,000 kids, right? And then you have charters. And you know, the number, I think it's 37 or 42 charters that are in the area. And then you have private schools. And then you also have approximately 3,000 early childhood centers. And then I'm not counting post-secondary. Post-secondary in terms of the institution that we're here today, University of Houston downtown, University of Houston, St. Thomas, Rice University, Texas Southern University, HCC, San Jack. Uh, my goodness, oftentimes, sometimes when I miss a school, people come back later and, oh, you forgot my school. So I will just say all of these beautiful <laughs> institutions of post-secondary, K through 12, early childhood, private, charter, all of those that exist in this space. The question is then, what are the challenges? We have a dramatically changing demographic. Many of us have heard Professor Kleinberg describe the Houston Area Survey many, many years and talks about how there is such an importance for the young people, the young people who are predominantly becoming more and more students of color, African American, Latino, Asian children, young people that are going to be 18 when this community celebrates its 200th anniversary in 2036, right? And so are we going to be able to be a city of the future if we do not ensure that every child throughout the city is going to be able to succeed, to have access to a rigorous, welcoming, inclusive, responsive, comprehensive high school that exists in this city especially in their own neighborhood. And also, I will ask the students here that are experiencing post-secondary readiness, how many young people here have had an opportunity to connect to Houston's dynamic economy via an internship opportunity? 
right? So raise those hands again. I saw two very raised. Right? So we've got okay, so we've got some folks that are like, maybe I was in an internship. <laughs> I think I was in an internship, and I am in an internship. Every single young person, it's so critical for you to be able to connect to the local economy that exists in this dynamic city of Houston. Why? Why is that important? Well, one, it's important to make some money, right? But the money doesn't really matter. What matters is that you make connections to adults that can help you and that can provide you with guidance and good, credible, responsible advice about your future. That's you know, an area in which we really need to work on developing how can we better facilitate connecting young people to job opportunities, internship, apprenticeship programs, so that way while you're studying, you're earning and learning, and you can also make a conscientious effort if you've chosen the right major. Right? We now have laws that require young people at the age of eighth, when they're in eighth grade, to start picking their endorsements, which I think is great to be able to start looking at future options and looking at different classes that you're going to take. But you should have empowered family members and students and folks in the school community, counselors, teachers, and other persons that can provide strong guidance to answer the questions that the families and the children may have so that way they can make informed choices. I tell folks, I graduated in 1992. That was a long time ago. Many people in this room that are in school, you weren't even born, right? Right? Oh my gosh, that's true. You weren't even born. <laughs> I was hoping that wasn't true, but it's true. You weren't even born. And so the thing is, it's like, I often tell folks that I feel so blessed to have had a world-class education. But oftentimes I felt that there, it was good luck in many instances. It was that fantastic person that took time to answer my questions. It was that teacher or that professor that told me about the internship. It was that individual that told me that I had to fill out a FAFSA form to be able to get financial aid. It was that opportunity to say, what in the world is in that office and why is everyone going in there? You know, and it, so it's asking those questions that are critical and key and so what I say, it's like, the world is dramatically changing. We continue to function in a way in which we are responsive to the design of what existed probably when I was a student. In order for us to meet and accomplish what we want to do, which is empowering every single student in this room, we must be transformative and innovative in designing school systems that are responsive to the unique needs of communities as they exist at present. And it also requires us to be able to differentiate and use a strong methodology of being economical and efficient and targeted in the way we are allocating our resources so we're not wasting dollars and money and things that we don't necessarily need, but so that we are making sure that we're focusing on designing plans that meet your needs of what's happening now not what happened when I was in school, right? Because you can benefit a little bit from what I can tell you, but boy, you can benefit a whole lot more if you have someone that actually knows what the industries are that require the skill set that you're trying to develop right here, right now. And so I say that another thing that we really have to work on is breaking down the silos and making sure that the early childhood time frame, the K through 12 system, and the post-secondary have communication amongst each other. And God bless the different agencies of the state coming up with the tri-agency report and also the 60 by 30 plan. I strongly encourage folks, if you do not know what that is, look it up. It's very interesting. It talks about how we want the state of Texas to be empowered with at least some level of post-secondary skills and training, at least 60% of the population having some type of post-secondary readiness by 2030. And so the thing is, but that's going to require us to work together in very new and creative ways. 
that's going to require people to say, hey, guess what? Maybe you're going to have to be uncomfortable and give up some of your power. Maybe you're going to have to feel uncomfortable and ask some questions. So that way we can start working together and sharing the resources, working with this, everything and every type of asset that we have here. Remember, second most prosperous city in the country. We've got the largest medical center in the world. We've got tremendous universities. We've got 17 school districts all over the place. We've got many early childhood centers. But how can we strategically come up with a vision and a plan as a community to ensure that we're designing something that is especially going to take in mind the most vulnerable children, families, and communities so that way they are empowered to succeed in today's economy. Thank you, Julia. Question, okay, we have a question back here. Hi, my name's Rome Street, and this question is for Juliet. Uh, how do you empower people in your capacity as director of education? And also, uh, can you share some projects that you're working on with us? Yes, um, thank you for that question. I also tell folks it's like a gold star for asking a question. That's one thing that I often tell folks. It's like when you're in an audience, make sure to ask questions. It's really important. Um, so at the city of Houston, one thing that I've been able to do is I've just had the blessing of being able to meet with so many different organizations that exist in the city of Houston. You will hear, uh, I have a dear friend named Adabi Bar Adi Barkawi who says, we are a city that's very program rich, but system poor. You've got programs all over the city. And I, I tell folks, I thought that at one point, within one year's time, I'd be finished meeting with folks. I still have meetings to this day that people call me and they're like, can I tell you about the program that we're running? Can I talk to you a little bit about what we're trying to do to help this community? And trying to just keep a laundry list of all of these different activities and people that want to come and help campuses and schools and communities, it's tremendous. This especially became even more apparent during Hurricane Harvey, right? So on a general scale of some large citywide programs that we've been working on, one, there's Mayor's Higher Houston Youth Program. It's a, it's an, a, a program in which we are attempting to have 16 to 24 year olds connect to jobs at the city of Houston or in a nonprofit or at a local company and we will get sponsorship dollars to allow for youth to work at nonprofits in case nonprofits cannot pay the youth. We want to make sure that all the positions are paid for. Um, it opens in the summer. Uh, I strongly encourage young people to visit the website. It's www.hirehoustonyouth.org. We also have another citywide initiative, which is a collaboration with the Houston Endowment, the United Way, Harris County Department of Education, and the city of Houston, in which it's called Out to Learn. And you can go and look at the website, www.out, the number two, learn, H-O-U.org. And that will provide you with a database of out-of-school, after-school programs that exist in the city of Houston, just in case you're interested in learning or sharing with your loved ones, your, uh, you know, your brothers and sisters, your nieces, your, you know, you can have an opportunity. It's geographically located as well. And I'm really proud to say we won a national award for that website. So, um, but it's the first website of its kind in Houston. Dallas had the first one for 10 years. Uh, we learned a lot from Dallas's, but Houston's got the national award. <laughs> so I strongly encourage you to take a look at that website. Um, and then, you know, in terms of post-Hurricane Harvey, we have been working with uh, Texas Children's Hospital, the Harris Health System, the Collaborative for School Behavioral Health, UNICEF, and other partners uh, to take a strong look at psychosocial, emotional supports, training the trainers, assisting folks post-Harvey, especially since uh, many of the issues of stress and trauma uh, do not just go away within the first year. In fact, many of it come to the fruition and become even stronger three, four years out. And so we are uh, currently hosting a meeting at all the different um, council member districts throughout the city of Houston to gather information from community members about um, what we can do to better serve. Um, so those are just some small examples. Uh, in terms of Hurricane Harvey, we did a lot of uh, just different types of activities to try to bring supplies, resources, and supports to communities in need. Uh, we worked with UNICEF during that to make sure that we prioritize allocation to those that were hardest hit by the storm. 
Uh, and I will tell folks that during that time frame, it was as if I received a graduate level course in working with others and trying to develop a post-disaster intervention plan. And some of the uh, initiatives and programs that we designed were actually uh, then taken and used in Puerto Rico. Um, so just know um, that the things that we do here in town, your wisdom, your uh, interests, your concern, what you have done in this space is taken note and it's serving as a guide in other areas around the world. So I want to say thank you for everyone here because every Houstonian I know worked very, very hard in making sure that the city uh, was able to uh, recover and continues to recover after Hurricane Harvey. Thank you, Juliet. Okay, so I, I, I would imagine that some of you have more questions that you want to ask, but we're gonna we're gonna hear from Senator Kelliger, a uh, Seliger, excuse me, uh, and then uh, Mr. Craybill, and then at the end we'll have time for more questions. So, Senator, thank you very much. Please allow me to stand. I've been sitting all day, and apparently puts too much pressure on my brain. But uh, it's, it's a real honor to be here today and talk about this. And as you listen, one of the things you can't help but hearing is a near evangelical fervor about public education. And there's a reason for that. Someone once said that education is a state's contribution to our nation's defense. In what way? It's our defense against ignorance. What could possibly more, be more important? Sitting in Texas classrooms today is the future of the state of Texas. And it's gonna be a different future and there are different people now more than ever before, young people sitting in those classrooms, more of them of color, more of them qualifying for free and reduced price lunch, far more of them English as a second language, and all that stuff doesn't matter because it is all human potential, it is all of a great deal of value to the state of Texas. Keep in mind one thing, there is not one less capability, one less bit capability in students in River Oaks than there is in a neighborhood, another neighborhood around the city of Houston. Capability, ability is distributed equally around our population, opportunity is not. And that's ed education that closes that gap. And that's why it's critically important. It's why we've done some sort of things under Senator Taylor's leadership in, in public education. Under House Bill 5, we created the five uh, tracks in school. That there's the academic track, the most strenuous one, of course, science, technology, and engineering, and math. And not the least rigorous, but the complete departure from that is a career and technical track we have now that we used to call vocational education. And there are now today in public schools so many different things in the 80 or 90 school districts I represent in the 31st district. Computer game design, culinary science, automobile mechanics, all those things, and each one carries with it. The academic requirement to meet the, the demands of Texas essential knowledge and skills so that students capable of going into the workplace with a certificate and still go to community college. We're looking at education, different paradigms of education than we ever have before. And I don't know how many of you think of it today, but UH downtown uh, occupies a leading position because used to be an awful lot of the students that are here today would work hard, provide for their families. If they didn't have an education at that point, they wouldn't get it. But today they will, regardless of the age group or regardless of the vocation of that individual because everybody can do better. Everybody can do more. And a lot of the key to that is a lot of it is education. And, and uh, so um, let me give you an example of Hereford High School up in the Panhandle in a town where there are more beef cattle than there are people, and, which you can't educate, by the way. And uh, they have a program in, in automobile mechanics. And so they go in in the fall, somebody contributed a car, and they take it down to the very last nut and bolt. And by May, it has to be put together, and they have to drive it off, and there cannot be any spare parts sitting on the floor. And those young people are doing something they want to do. Let me give you another example in uh, River Road High School in Amarillo. They brand new, brand new build, not a brand new building, a newly renovated building for a cosmetology program. The day I were there, there, was tw there were 20 young people. These were all girls, and they were involved in cosmetology program. 
the interesting thing there is every one of them was at risk, which meant by the eighth or ninth grade, they were expected to drop out. But there they were, juniors and seniors, doing their academic work and working in cosmetology. They were all gonna graduate with a diploma and a certificate, and they were all in school. Bless the heart of the one young girl. She's about this tall and couldn't have been more than 15, and she's working away on this dummy who was not a member of the Texas Senate. And, and I walked up to her and I said, well, is there anything you could do to help me? And uh, she just looked at me with this stricken look on her face, looked like she was going to cry. And when, but the point is, is, is that education represents something very, very important to every individual. And that individual represents something very, very important to the rest of us. And for those of us who are concerned about the future of the state of Texas, the single most important thing, and a lot of my career has been spent in economic development, and, and Houston has been a hotbed for that. But of all the things that people look at when they come to a great city like Houston, first and foremost, workforce. Workforce. That's what's going to make the company of the future is the workforce. As Senator Taylor pointed out, about 20% of the jobs that will exist in 20 years, we don't know what they are. We just don't know. We know they will probably require some capability in technology or the use of technology, but we don't know what they are. And so one of the great roles of education is not just teaching people, but teaching people how to learn, realizing that by the time you're 50 years old, you may very well have to learn two or three different jobs. Hopefully everyone will re represent greater opportunity for you and your family. Uh, one of the biggest issues that we will deal with in the coming legislative session that starts January 8th, of course, is, is the budget, public school finance. It's 38% of the Texas budget. It's about 100, between public education and higher education, $110 billion a year. And that grows by about 70 or 80,000 kids in, in uh, public schools a year. It's about 1.5 million individuals, not all young people, in colleges and universities. And, and that's our challenge, uh, to see to it that by the year 2030, 60% of Texans have some sort of certificate or diploma. That's the building block of the future. And so all these things go to underscore just how important education is and how important it is to have good schools and good institutions and, and how to work at it. It's not, the answer is not always just money. Worst thing you can do from, from a governmental point of view is just throw money at problems. It's always this that creates the problem. It's not cold, hard cash. Cash is not unimportant, but we have to keep our priorities. We see some of the most amazing things, one of the most successful school districts in the state of Texas is San Juan, far San Juan Alamo, down in the valley. It is a poor school district. It is almost 100% Latino and English as a second language is predominant, yet it's one of the most successful school districts in the state of Texas because they're creative and they're dedicated and, and they're open to new ideas. This is particularly true of education, where we're trying to educate a, 21, a 21st century workforce with about a 19th century educational system. Do you know why, I'm gonna use you, you know why he's in third grade? Because he's eight, if he is capable of fifth grade work, why are we having him do third grade work? There's no good reason. There, here's the worst reason. And this isn't true in any endeavor, because that's the way we've always done it. <laughs> and as Senator Taylor pointed out, it's the worst excuse for anything. So we have public schools that, what other endeavor that you're aware of and, and I come from private business, as does Senator Taylor, where you operate the business for nine and a half months, say, we're done, it's as good as we can do. That's why the South Koreans and the Finnish are so good at public education, because it's a year-round endeavor. Now then, clearly that requires a sea change in a lot of areas and things like that, but we're, not, we're far from being efficient in the way that we educate young people. Uh, the way that, that, that we employ teachers and, and things like that. Those are some of the issues that we have to deal with. A political statement, not a partisan statement. Mr. Brown, <clears throat> you sort of highlighted one of the fundamental challenges that we have 
in any area of policy in this state. I talk to groups all the time, I said, and it's certainly true of school boards, we have the government we deserve. Generally really agitates people and sometimes make them, makes them really mad, but I'm a politician and I'm used to it. We have the government we deserve because of who we vote for or who we don't vote for or if we don't vote at all. Almost every single election in this country is determined by a minority of the population. And so we get exactly what we deserve. That's where we see fringe groups come on because sometimes they're the most motivated group. How can any of us not be motivated by things like the education of our children and the value of our workforce, the way we educate those children? And yet, you know who's gonna win the next election? You know who's gonna win the election of 2024? How about 2030? No, I'm not a psychic. I'm sorry? Apathy. You're not wrong, but the, the answer is apathy. Apathy's a great candidate and appears to rule in almost every single election. I'm sorry, that's a terrible comment. It's, it's the option we have in a free nation, but uh, that's not a good candidate. Thank you for letting me be here today. Thank you, Senator. Questions for Senator Seliger? No questions? Oh, okay. Raise your hands again. Okay. Okay, you were talking, you very shortly talked about um, other nations going to school year round. I have a very good friend. Um, quote from her from this weekend was We only teach nine months because we're pushed so hard during those nine months. We want, we need three months off. She goes to work at seven o'clock, comes home 5.30, does another three hours of working on the weekends. That's what she does. She has been moved around from science to math. She's now teaching two different maths and she's 28. How do you want to go to a year, you know, maybe a year round school or something like that. How are you going to treat the teachers better? I'm not necessarily prescribing anything because I'm not an educator. So I don't presume to tell you how you're going to run your school system. But if you're working year round and you use shorter work blocks or you weren't going to school as early or going late, the thing is if the schools are not about the people that work there. They're about those children in the schools. What's best for that? that young mind and, and to keep it exercised, curious and endeavoring. The way we have Texas Essential Knowledge and Skills with th 394 of them, you barely have time in 180 class days to get all those in. That system is flawed too and we, we've tried to change it. The, the point is not to prescribe one specific fix to that, but to be thinking about how we can do it better. That's all. And we know the system we're using now, we talk about whatever the shortcomings I point out or that you point out, is we know we can do better. But are you saying then that since this is always the way we've done it, that that's the way we need to do it in the future? No, you want to be careful about doing that. And can I add one thing to that, Senator, behind you? With technology today, you know, there are games out there now, particularly these younger ages, that they can read and do math, and they're playing a game. And some of these games are a lot of fun and they're very creatively done. And the fact is, if you give a child a device to take home for whatever break there is, and you have a contest over the summer, or who has the most points, or who gets the most highest levels, you're going to have kids tricked into learning while they're playing a game. And once you do that, game over. We win. Because they're going to become educated, and they're not going to have that drop-off over the summer. It may actually go up over the summer with their math and their reading skills, things like that. You know, right now we have about 42% of our third graders read at third grade level. You know the importance of third grade reading for a child's future and education? This is one of the biggest determiners of how well they're going to do in their future education. Because up to third grade, you're learning to read. After third grade, you're reading to learn. So if you haven't gotten there, it's a real problem. So if we can have these kind of, with technology, the 21st century, once again, we can do better. And it's not necessarily hiring more teachers and having kids all summer. It may just be about implementing more technological things that these kids are already used to anyway. They love it. Um, so anyway, I just want to throw that in. I won't go long. Let's talk about a tale of two school districts. Houston Independent School District and up in the panhandle, Laz Buddy. Don't we all wish we could go to a school district, go to a school place called Laz Buddy? 
Houston has 320,000 students. I'm sorry? 215. Last body has 176. They don't have nearly the offerings in art and foreign languages and things like Houston ISD. And yet, we have the same aspirations for those kids in the panhandle as we do in Houston. How are we going to get there? Clearly, the classroom teacher is probably the single biggest answer there, but technology is going to close that opportunity gap in, in public. That's why, it's, that's, that's why Larry doesn't overemphasize the, um, the importance of technology. Have you all been in schools where they use smart boards now? Have you seen those smart boards work? What an innovation. You think, well, that's a gee whiz fancy deal. Uh, it's, it's better than that. It can be a really good teaching aid. I've taken too much of AJ's time. Thank you, Senator. I have another question back here. Uh, I'm sorry? I have another question. So I first want to add a comment. Uh, I do echo your sentiment, and I agree that people should be motivated to vote. The issue is that we find that in a lot of low-income schools, a lot of the parents uh, are immigrants, and they can't vote. So I would, um, you know, appreciate it if we said, hey, you know, it's okay to vote and be passionate about voting, but not also not make people that can't vote feel a little bad. If they can't vote, they're not responsible for, for the government that we have. They are responsible for their children, though. And they, so. and they do a good job of that. I'm talking about the responsibility of people who can vote to vote. Well, thank you for that clarification. Now, my question was, um, you did a great uh, lot of emphasis on the certification programs and the cosmetology, but I just read as of September 11th that the TEA was thinking about cutting that program in certain schools because apparently the salary wasn't... Um, good enough uh, for for the program so a lot of there you know people were saying hey what's what's happening you know they're not including the tips uh, in this so so TA is planning on cutting that I don't know what's going on right now I haven't really followed through with it but I would like to be a little more informed on that who do you think makes the rules in Austin TA or the legislature legislature you're right there will be a long discussion before they drop anything that is a worthwhile endeavor and vocation for young people. It is not for us to decide what your aspiration ought to be, but to see to it if we can educationally do what will allow you to reach your aspirations. Is it the highest paying thing? No, but all work, all honest work is honorable. And, and the marketplace will take care of itself. A lot of people say, I can't make much money in cosmetology. I won't go. Okay, go to another vocational program, and what will happen is demand will take care of it then. Thanks. Good question. All right, back here. One more question, then we want to go to Mr. Crable. Uh, yeah, I wanted to say thank you guys first for being here. Um, so right now, through the University of Houston downtown, I have the privilege of working with Luskin Elementary School, which is one of the Achieve 180 schools on the near north side. And I'm really noticing uh, something that I've noticed for a couple of years, because I have a number of teachers in my family who work in HISD, and they always tell me about the lack of the programming in their schools, the uh, middle schools all the way up to the high school, elementary school. So first, I wanted to ask, what was that? High, what was the school that you mentioned during your speech? And then secondly, like, what were the programs that they instituted to kind of create like a bounce back environment? You know, that, to make them the most successful district, because a lot of the uh, teachers that I speak with, even the administrators, they're very spread very thin. You know, they work in the office or they teach. Uh, some counselors are forced to do administrative work because there's not enough staff. Um, so they don't have the time necessarily to, to try to identify what ancillary programs might benefit the students the best. So is there ever any opportunity for like the state to, the same way that we standardize testing expectations, to standardize programs across like the, the school districts across the state so that the people in the panhandle and the people in HISD can aspire to the same thing, and then you can let the market kind of try to jump in to fill for each school. You know? When it comes to standardization, and the way we do with utilization of Texas essential knowledge and skills, because all these young people have to be taught the same thing academically. When it comes to career and technical things, we allow school districts a huge amount of leeway to teach the things that their local industry need and want and what their young people want. If you're talking about Far San Juan Alamo, 
Um, I specifically, I don't know what programs, in this case, in, his name is Dr. King, has implemented, but it's to emphasize resources in the classroom. That's, that's, that's where rubber meets the road, if you will. There's a reasonably new uh, superintendent in Midland by the name of Orlando Riddick, and he recently said, and this is important, he has never seen a failing school where parents are engaged, ever. If you ask superintendents around the state, the one thing that they could use the most, most of them won't tell you money. They'll tell you it's parents. Right. I don't mean to be particularly facile with it because think about a single parent family where a parent has to work two or three jobs. That parent is not there to sit at the, at the dinner table, clear the dishes and say, now we're going to do homework and we're going to make you put down the, the, the cell phone or step away from the computer and we're going to work on history and math. I realize that limitation doesn't exist. I'm simply pointing out what the challenge is for educators. It's a tough job. But I think educators will, will, will tell you, as a general rule, their best students are the ones whose, whose families help drive them. And then you find there's extraordinary students. And, and it's unusual because it takes a tremendous amount of motivation and discipline, kind of hard sometimes to find in 12-year-olds, 13-year-olds, and 14s. And when, it, when you do find it, incredible. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, last but not least, Mr. Crable. Tell us, from your vantage point, what are the issues that you're dealing with? What are the top issues that you're dealing with from your vantage point here in the state of Texas? <laughs> well, uh, uh, <laughs> first, <laughs> besides these ones, uh, <laughs> um, first, I just want to say thank you, um, University of Houston downtown, for hosting us and bringing me together with my colleague from the mayor's office and my bosses from the Senate. Um, I, I want to answer that in two parts uh, briefly, but then I really just want to open the floor for questions. Uh, the number one uh, concern on my heart when we think about how do we improve the quality of education for children across Texas uh, is always a question of how do we uh, best support, prepare, uh, attract, and retain uh, really great professionals in the classrooms. Uh, that's where it begins. That's where it ends. Everything else uh, is exist in support of that relationship between the learner uh, and the educator. Um, and so the strategies that we're focusing on at the agency are really geared toward how do we cause that uh, to be as high quality of an interaction or relationship as it can possibly be. In, in terms of what are some of the big, uh, big picture issues that we're looking at as an agency, uh, you've already heard about a lot of them. We're deeply concerned uh, about issues around safety. Our children have to be safe before they can be educated. Um, there are legitimate funding considerations that we're talking about, uh, and we're looking at what are lessons learned from places around the state uh, where they've been innovative with how they've deployed limited resources to get increased uh, outcomes for students. Uh, and then, you know, probably if I had to list one more thing, it'd probably be early learning. Uh, it, the best way to avoid having to remediate is to educate um, before you have a problem emerge. And, and so trying to um, find ways uh, within existing constraints uh, to increase children's access to pre-K uh, we think is a really important lever to pull on uh, to improve uh, education with children across the state. Uh, I'll stop there. I, I know you all have questions. Uh, let's get after it. What do you got for me? Excellent. I'm back. <laughs> Thank you all again. Damon Barone, um, I have a question that, is, uh, that concerns governance. Um, we talked a lot about when things are going right, but unfortunately when things are not going right, those are the times that people need help. It's kind of like you never realize how much insurance you don't have until you get into an accident. So my concern is that when the administration, for example, the district that I live in, the uh, HR administration, doesn't have experience. They have one individual that ha has HR experience and they're not a director there. So that causes issues and concerns there. 
So then when the school board does not govern or refuses to govern or passes over their governance power, that compounds the problem. Then when the parent or the community gets to the Texas Education Agency, all of a sudden the parent or the community is expected to um, um, held to a higher standard as if they have a bar or a, a legal degree. They must cite uh, education codes. They must cite policies and procedures. So my concern is what mechanisms are put in place? We talked about the community being socially and economically challenged. We talked about the community being English as a second language, and we tout on that when we educate them. However, we don't understand that we also abuse those powers or that we abuse those positions when it's time for them to to um, work on governance or work on their grievances or work on their concerns. So my concern is that why are these same people that we're talking about held to the same standard as an organization that has experience with those governing issues and those policies when they get to TEA, now you expect them to quote policies and procedures, quote uh, education code of ethics. Who's there really truly for the people? That's my question, if that makes sense. Yeah, so part of the question I hear asked is this is fundamentally about the accessibility of you know, our government. Our, our government doesn't exist to serve itself, it exists to serve us. Uh, and, and there have to be processes and procedures in place you know, to facilitate that. One of the things that we've changed uh, in my time at the agency uh, to try to make that happen, uh, first we want to be more transparent in a lot of our processes and procedures at the agency. And so we've uh, been more intentional about posting those online, uh, making those more accessible, more available, so that people can actually know what the processes are, so it's, it's not hidden, it's not obfuscated. Uh, but some of the other things we've done is we've gone back and we've reimagined you know, some of the processes that we do have in place and trying to identify where can we streamline this, where can we make this more accessible, where can we make this easier. Uh, there are a lot of school districts out there, a, and unfortunately there's not um, an unlimited number of staff at the agency. And, and so you're always trying to find a way to balance between how do we serve the entire state as effectively as possible uh, with the uh, limited resources uh, that we have available. Uh, and so I, I would definitely submit to you, we're never going to get that, we're never going to be perfect at that. There, there's always going to be this gap. Uh, the, the only solution to that is to have this unlimited behemoth of government. Um, and that's really a non-answer as well. Uh, and so there's always going to be this tension. Uh, what there is for us to do as public servants is to constantly look for how can we optimize, how can we make government more transparent, how can we make government more accessible. Um, thinking of recently, I was visiting with my staff who do a lot of our complaints management work, and my question for them was, what are we doing to make sure that anybody across the state, if they have concerns about their school district, that they can access us? Um, we receive complaints that are faxed in, we receive complaints that are hand delivered on scraps of paper, we receive complaints uh, that are emailed in, we can receive complaints in a wide variety of languages, we received a complaint that was delivered to us in braille. Uh, like we will do whatever it takes to make sure that uh, the concerns that folks have, that we're gonna open ourselves up to receiving those um, and, and then putting those through the, uh, through the process uh, that is fair and equitable. But again, to your point, uh, are we ever perfect at that? Are we ever, have we ever arrived? No, this is always a journey. Um, and y your task is to hold us responsible for keeping our foot uh, on the gas on that journey, you know, and not slacking off. Would you talk a little bit about what you do with the performance? Some of the things you do Yeah, so the question uh, from the dais is, you know, what are some of the things that uh, the legislature has really challenged the agency to do as it relates to when there is underperformance. Uh, there are a few different uh, categories that we look at for underperformance. We look at statutory, you know, did they follow all the laws? You know, a common law uh, that people run up against is did they have all the people fingerprinted? This is a health and safety issue for our students, right? But that's a statutory you know, question. Uh, we also have financial questions. You know, have they demonstrated uh, that they are operating you know, in good faith as fiduciaries for taxpayer resources. Uh, we also look at governance. To what extent is the board governing effectively? And then finally, the area that we really look at is 
well, academically, and this is where the majority of the agency's resources are deployed, is to what extent are students actually learning and, and getting access to the promise of public education to the degree they deserve. Uh, what the legislature has put in place is this A through F system uh, and says, you know, our, we have to have a way of identifying relative levels of quality uh, in terms of how well is a student performing or how well is the school performing? And, and I said or intentionally because it, in our system it is an either or. Uh, this can't just be, to Senator Taylor's point, about what is happening in that zip code. Is it a wealthy zip code? Is it a zip code where families are struggling more? It, it has to be a conversation about how well are students doing or uh, but how well are we doing it causing growth in those students? How well is the school doing it really challenging and growing students year over year? Uh, and so when a school system uh, is underperforming on both of those measures because in order to get a low performing grade overall you have to be underperforming on both of those not just one but both when that happens the statute the legislature's put in place uh, a lot of Houstonians probably know by heart you know the numbers are 1842 House Bill 1842 that essentially says if you allow the children in a particular community to, to suffer for five years in a row, that you have created a circumstance where the rest of us as Texans have an obligation to step in and see to the well-being of those children. Now, that, that is a bold and a harsh statement. Uh, it, it's bold because, to Senator Taylor's point, it used to be almost indefinite uh, underperformance was allowable under statute, and they've changed that. Um, but it's but it's also necessary, you know, because as Senator Seliger describes, if we don't do this well, we're snatching from children the promise. Um, and so even though we lift up this idea of independent school districts, there has to be a limit. There has to be a point where if for whatever reason we haven't met the needs of our students, that there has to be a conversation about how do we make it right for those kids? How do we not allow them to suffer for five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years? And so that's what the statute describes, is that the agency is obligated uh, when children have been underserved for five years consecutively, uh, that the agency is obligated by the legislature to, to intercede um, and to see toward uh, the educational well-being of those students. Uh, this is an important conversation for us to have. Uh, and, and there are passionate ideas on all sides of this. Uh, if, if you haven't seen passion on the stage, you haven't been paying attention. There's a reason people care about this, because this is some of the stuff that matters most. You know, how, do we, how do we care for, how do we attend to the needs of our students? Uh, and so yes, th this, is going to, this is going to challenge people uh, as the state rolls this out. Uh, there are going to be people who uh, don't enjoy uh, the direction that the legislature has uh, sent the agency, but the underlying reason behind those actions uh, is that there has to be a point we have to say right is right um, and, and when children aren't getting that that after a certain point the rest of Texans have a collective obligation to those children and they have to step forward and there is now empowering legislation in the form of uh, 1842 uh, that not only suggests that uh, but the five-year mark obligates that. Uh, I saw your hand go up. Too long, and I say that only because <laughs> uh, only because it takes so long to break a habit that's been formed. So, do you, I mean, you don't think that stepping in sooner would, you know, correctify that? You know, because to me, I feel like if you wait five years, you can't correct that because if they're ESL, you know, there's that 90 to 10, that 80 to 20, that 60 to, you know, those that has been ruined. So if they've been getting nothing but strictly Spanish you know, that entire time without those five years, because they're supposed to come out of that program at a certain, you know, extent, you know, how, what, what good does that do them? You can't rectify that. It's ruined. Yeah, to this, be honest, yeah, it's, it's ruined. So how do, you, how do you fix that? Yeah, this but, is know, a great point. Uh, and, and so there has to be some uh, variability uh, in the law that allows for uh, the judgment of professionals uh, to be expressed. And so the way that the legislature wrote that into the statute uh, is that, as schools slide into underperformance, as they, as they fall into that you know, D and F range, um, in their first and second year, uh, there's an obligation that they submit a plan of action to the agency that says, this is what we're going to do to get right for these children. But the law now allows for as, 
if the commissioner looks at that planning and, and determines that the district isn't really taking its obligations to these children seriously, the agency has the, the, uh, has the ability uh, to intercede at year two, three, and four. Uh, I'll be honest with you that it would take a considerable uh, underperformance on the part of the district for the agency uh, to step in, so it's not something that we you know, think of lightly, but it is an authority the commissioner takes seriously and, and is willing to deploy if that circumstance, uh, if that circumstance demands it. However, the statute mandates action at five years. So at year two, it becomes uh, an option if it is just really clear that we have to move in now, that, that things are so bad for our children that, w that we really have to intercede now. But statute mandates at five years. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you all for coming here. Uh, I'm Ron Beebe. I'm a professor of educational research here at uh, University of Houston downtown. Um, you, you all touched on, and, and you, Mr. Crabill, specifically talked about early childhood education. Uh, Senator, you talked about the, the thing by third grade. There, there are numerous studies that, that show that for every dollar spent in providing quality early childhood education, communities reap anywhere between eight and 22 dollars on the back side of that, depending on who did the study and, and, what, they, and what they configured. Um, a few years back, we had a proposition here in Houston to put a penny tax to, to provide support. We couldn't get that passed. Uh, Governor Abbott ran last year on a platform that said we need to provide pre-K to the state of Texas. That didn't pass. What can we do in this state to make the investment into early childhood that's going to take care of the third grade reading problem. It's not going to be a problem at third grade because it's addressed at early childhood. Research also indicates that quality early childhood care provides solid foundation for students who are considered at risk, right? So, I mean, it, it seems to me that that would be a very good investment of time and, and effort in order to really improve the educational outcome of our students here in Texas. Would you talk about what we did do, either one of you all? Yeah, Governor Abbott had the initiative, and we did pass it in 2015. And it was for high-quality pre-K. And you realize we're already spending a billion plus or whatever, the, I don't, don't quote me on the numbers, but we're spending several billion dollars on pre-K. So the discussion last session was, Okay, we've got this money for high quality pre K. What is everything else? And why are we spending money on something that's not really quality pre K? So the idea was re let's reinforce the high quality pre K because you, know, you can have kids just sitting around doing nothing, and that's not really helping the kid. But uh, high quality, you have the, a good instructor with good curriculum where they're actually, you know, they're, they're still having fun, but they're learning. Uh, another thing I would just tell you real quick on, on that issue that you're addressing the Public School Finance Commission is recognizing as well, and it's, it's a matter of reallocating some dollars that are already in the system in places, for example, the high school allotment. Okay, we, we did that a few years ago to help on some other formula thing, but really, the money, we're, we're spending more money on career tech and those types of things, but there, some of that money could be reallocated towards early pre-K type stuff. But it's not just pre-K, because you know about the drop-off as well. If you just have high-quality pre-K, and then it drops off in first, second grade, that doesn't help either because, in fact, there is a drop-off. The kids will show up better prepared, and then by the time they're in third grade, it's dropped back to almost close to where everybody else is. So it's a follow-through. It starts with pre-K, getting them prepared for it, but then you've got to follow through, and you've got to have quality education. All we, we've heard stories of you know, schools hiring their best teachers to put them in third grade because that's the year we test. I'm sorry, that's too late. That's a bad strategy. You don't teach a kid in one year all those things. You can teach some kids in one year. And self pace or some kids could do certain, but, but generally, you're not going to take a child who's not reading at grade level in second grade, and all of a sudden they're reading third, you know, if they're not reading grade level by second, they're not going to just make it one year. So, and here's what we're finding more and more is that school districts are taking it upon themselves to implement uh, pre K and things like that. I was just in an elementary school in an early childhood academy earlier this week, and they have a dedicated facility. This is not a wealthy school district. A dedicated facility goes all the way from pre-K to two or three, includes Head Start. 
And, and then it becomes a basic appropriation question. Since school districts are willing to do it, and I think that you find want to do it, then it becomes a question of just basic formula, having the money there and formula distributed to all school districts, so all ships, in this case, early childhood ships, are raised all over the state of Texas. But I think that is very rapidly becoming a real priority. And the question of, you know, making sure that it's full day pre-K, which would be fantastic, because HISD, um, you know, gets the half day pay and then put in local, its own dollars to pay for the full day pre-K. But, you know, the other question is, there's so many of these early childhood centers, you know, that are serving the zero to three, and many of them are private. And so it's outside of the public system, and yet these dollars are coming from the Texas Workforce Commission. And then you don't necessarily have a lot of synergy in terms of the collection and the sharing of information between different agencies. And oftentimes when I talk to folks and I'm like, yeah, do you know that the child care subsidy comes from the Texas Workforce Commission? Many people are not aware of that. And so there needs to be, and I know that there is a push towards that in getting the different agencies to work more closely with one another. Um, also the utilization of scholarships um, in the area of pre-K is something that is oftentimes entertained, or also the opportunity of being able to utilize teachers from the K through 12 system creatively in the early child um, center space. And, and that's something that's just a really creative approach of being able to just have synergy uh, in educational opportunities. If I could add just one more thing on the, o the overall funding that we're talking about in school finance. Another thing we found in, in through our discussions is it's the intensity of the poverty. You know, if you have 10% of your population is low income, qualifies for free and reduced lunch, that's a whole different scenario than somebody who's at 80 and 90%. And so we're actually, we're, we're recommending adjusting the formula. Funny one, we're bumping it from 1.2 to 1.22, all the way up to 1. I don't remember what the number was, 26 or something. But you get more based on the intensity of the poverty because it's a much more dire situation and, you know, generally if you have somebody that's in a 10% low income, well, they see opportunities all around them. They're, they're, they're experiencing it. But if you're surrounded with 80, 90% of low income, you don't see those opportunities. You don't even know there's a different world out there. And so it's an intensity there that we're going to recognize in our, in our updated formulas to make sure we allocate dollars to where the need is the greatest to make sure we take care of this portion of our population that, frankly, we've not been doing a great job on. Okay, it is 10 minutes after 7, so we are, we are a little bit running over time. I want to give an opportunity for someone who has not asked a question. Does anyone would like to ask a final question? All right. Who? You have a question? He was like, let's get out of here. Sure. What, what grade is he in? What, what grade are you in? Sir. What's your name? Cameron. Cameron, who's your favorite teacher? My favorite teacher is Ms. Murphy. All right, let's hear from Ms. Murphy. Uh, hi, thank you for coming. Um, my name's Tamia Pia, and um, I'm a senior at Sci Falls in CFISD. And this year, we just implemented this new policy. Um, all of you kind of touched on safety, and we made this new clear backpack policy. And I just wanted to know your thoughts and opinions on that. Because me personally, as a student, and my fellow students, we've conversed about it in some of our classes, that a clear backpack just kind of seems like a Band-Aid or like a quick fix saying, hey, we're doing something. But it's not really that effective in safety, in our opinion. So I just wanted to know it, all of your thoughts on it. it you're right. It is a Band-Aid. It's intended to be a Band-Aid. It is a Band-Aid. Is it the answer to school security? No. Uh, it's why you have to have a clear purse to go into NRG Stadium on a Sunday. It's just one of those things they can see. There's so much more, and Senator Taylor touched upon it, how to harden school districts. Uh, I think in the end it's going to be human security, resource officers, and things like that. In a lot of areas they're talking about school teachers not necessarily being armed but having access to firearms. And uh, it's, it, my feeling is it's up to the local school district responding to local voters to do what they think will, will make schools safe. And so, yeah, but a lot of Band-Aids over a while will cover a pretty substantial wound. And I think there's such a strong need for more counselors and for psychosocial emotional supports um, for children that are um, demonstrating signs and symptoms of uh, stress, trauma, post-traumatic stress, uh, to be able to receive appropriate referrals, but also follow-up 
and being able to engage the, the parents and the students, also to destigmatize um, access and the importance of mental health is something that's just extraordinarily critical. I had an opportunity to meet with folks from Microsoft and they were talking about developing like a clicker button system um, to be able to have teachers have these types of systems available in the class. But I told them, I said, is there some way you could develop some type of technology for us to be able to, to try to get a gauge of how the children are feeling and what they're going through. I know that Adi Barkawi with ProUnitas has something that's comfortable in terms of a, a gauging system of trying to see where young people are at. But we really need to be able to follow up in terms of the mental health and being of our students. Well, thank you all. Let's give our, our panelists a, a round of applause. I want to I point something out, out to all of the students in this room. You see the passion, I hope, from the panelists here. We need that from you. We need you to be engaged in your work, and there's a lot of urban education students in this room. We need you to be passionately interested because that's the only way people are going to make a, 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 people are going to make a change. I think the, the the most salient thing that was said tonight was the comment about ap apathy. When people do nothing, oh, they're going to do it. They're going to take care of it. I elected somebody. They're going to take it. Oh, the principal's got it. The dean's got it. Oh yeah, that's my teacher. So, no, we got we got to we have to participate. It's a democracy. You have to get involved, and not just by complaining. We've got to do. We have to be engaged in the process. In 2015, of the registered voters of the ages of 18 to 24, okay. in 2015, of the uh, registered voters in the area that were seven, 18 to 24 year olds, how many young people came out and voted? What was the number of the registered voters that came out in that very important race? It was 7%. But on the other side of the spectrum, the vast majority of voters in that election that came out were over the age of 65. <laughs> so it's the student voice and the young person's voice is absolutely critical. If you want, and I, I won my first election with 42 votes. So, I mean, just please know that every single vote counts. And if you're a person that can't vote yet, Make sure you're out there block walking for the right candidates and supporting folks that you believe and you know will protect your family, your nannies, your granddads, your uncles, your family, and your community. Because every single person, regardless of status, has a right to a wonderful public quality school education and a right to participate in democracy. I mean, you, you heard it said from Mr. Crable when, when he, they're, they're taking all of the, the different complaints and whether, whatever form they're coming at, they're taking them and they're trying to do their best to respond to them. But somebody's got to make a decision about those complaints. Yeah. Who's going to make that decision if it's not you? If you're not involved in the process, somebody's going to make those decisions. Why not you? Why not you getting involved? And there's a myriad of ways that you can get involved. We need to get involved. We need to get involved. That, it's our lives. It's our future. It's, it's, it, it, that's what this country is all about. We have to get engaged in the process. So I want to end by bringing up uh, our dean, uh, Dean Van Horn, if you wouldn't mind coming up. OK. <laughs> so this, this series would, is the brainchild of Dean Van Horn. She thought it up, Vital Voices, and then she thought up the Vital Alumni, uh, bringing people back to the college. But it was her, her idea, her creativity, that, that created this series to bring people who, whose lives and whose work impact the public, a public service. That's what we're about, whether it's criminal justice, social work, urban education, right? It, it, is, it is people who, who are involved in the public good. So I wanted to bring the dean up to thank you for that, and then we wanted to give our guests a, a little something. But before we do that, I wanted, we thought you might want to say something. Well, I had my hand up a minute ago because <laughs> I, I just want to clarify, first of all, thank you. Um, this is beyond my wildest dreams. Years ago, I, I told Stephen I went to an imprint um, event in Houston. I love those. And I brought him the flyer. I said, I, I want to do something like this, and I like the way it's one word. And, and that's really how it happened. So we work as a team in the College of Public Service, and we begin a year ahead brainstorming. Who, who, who can we bring in? What would be important topics? 
And, and that's how Vital Voices began, really, and that's how it's going to be sustained. It's super important to us to bring you this kind of programming. What happened with Vital Alumni is we started seeing our students out there doing amazing things, and we said, let's bring them back because there's nothing more inspiring than seeing somebody you probably went to class with out there doing something amazing. And so that's been very exciting. We just started that, what, last year? We've only had a few. Um, so I want to hear your ideas about what kind of things you want to hear. This was tremendous, the attendance here, the passion. I did want to clarify for, for our leaders up front. Um, it's not that we don't have internships, because we do. They're just not paid. Um, we have 720 hours of internship that is part of required part of our degree program in urban education spent in schools. And we have... Um, a much higher rate of our graduates going back into the communities they came from and staying in teaching more than twice as long as most people do. So a high retention in the field. So education is going to be in some good hands. Um, in criminal justice, we have internships now for anyone who's not already in the Peace Force. And in social work, we have 440 hours of required internship within the program in agencies most recently innovating in social work and what we call Spanish track. You, okay, we're gonna have to talk because that's the idea. We found out there were many, many agencies in Houston uh, trying to do social work and no one in there spoke Spanish. So you're trying to address a population in crisis and people can't even communicate. So we, we spent some of our initiative money to hire people to intern, supervise our students in Spanish-speaking agencies, and they now have two in every agency, right? Because that's our student intern and the person we're paying to supervise them. Let us know how we can provide funds to have them paid internships for you. Wow, this is great. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, well, there'll be some follow-up for tonight. But uh, needless to say, am, am, am I proud and passionate to stand beside these individuals? Yes. Am I proud? To serve you, you betcha, because you are one heck of an amazing group of people. So thank you very much, and let us give some gifts. in our college, Paulina Gamino, right? Yep. And so thanks to her and thanks to you. We hope you'll put this proudly in your office and remember Thank your you. time with us. It is kind of beautiful, isn't it? Yes, it is. <laughs> Mr. Villano framed him himself. <laughs> You're welcome. Well, we just want you to remember us because we are certainly going to remember you. Right, folks?